Chapter 5, How Little John Came to the Greenwood. You gentlemen and yeomen good, come in and drink with Robin Hood. If Robin Hood be not at home, come in and drink with little John. After Robin Hood had rescued Will Scarlet from the Sheriff of Nottingham, he remained quietly in Sherwood Forest for some time, building huts in several of the most secret and hidden clearings, drilling his followers and teaching those who were new to it all the secrets of wood lore. Many came to swell his band, outlaws, poor men who were suffering under cruel masters, and even a yeoman or two and several who had been forced into the service of the sheriff or of various of the Norman knights and barons of the district. The Great North Road passed through the forest at that time, and surprise attacks supplied them with all they needed in the way of Lincoln green cloth and arrows, or the money with which to buy these. When order and comfort had been brought to this new commonwealth of the Greenwood and precautions taken against surprise by the sheriff or any of the neighboring knights such as Sir Guy of Gisborne and their followers, Robin began to go further afield. He knew that it would be well to have several places of refuge should Prince John send a large force to drive him out of Sherwood, and in time he and his men were able to disappear from the Nottingham district and were often to be found in Barnsdale, Yorkshire, or Plompton in Cumberland. On occasion, they were known even to visit Pendle Forest in Lancashire and Delamere Forest in Cheshire. Much of their time was taken up in archery, at which all became very proficient, though none, none could ever shoot so far or so true as Robin himself, and in fencing with swords or playing at quarterstaff. But there was time for hunting as well, since venison was the most usual food, varied with pork from the wild boars, hares, and various wild fowl. Many a time Robin would grow weary of the general course of every day and wander off by himself, leaving Will Scarlet in command. Often he returned from these expeditions with news of a party of wealthy travelers to be waylaid and robbed, or of some new injustice or cruelty practiced against a Saxon yeoman or Saxon serfs. Sometimes he returned with a new member for his band of outlaws, and the most noteworthy of these chance meetings won for him the truest and most faithful of all his friends. It was late in their first summer in Sherwood, and on a sudden, Robin grew restless. Stay you all here, my merry fellows, he said early one morning, but come and come swiftly if you hear the blast on my horn that you all know as my special call. We have had no sport these fourteen days and more. No adventure has befallen us, so I will go forth and seek for one. But if I should find myself in difficulties with no escape, then will I blow my horn. Then he bade farewell to Scarlet and the rest and set off blithely through the greenwood, his bow ready in his hand, his eyes and alert, ears alert for anything of danger or of interest. About noon he came along a forest path to a wide, swiftly flowing stream, which was crossed by a narrow bridge made of a single tree trunk flattened on the top. As he approached it, he saw a tall yeoman hastening towards him beyond the stream. We cannot both cross at once. The bridge is too narrow, thought Robin, and he quickened his pace, meaning to be first over. But the tall yeoman quickened his pace also, with the result that they each set foot on the opposite ends of the bridge at the same moment. Out of my way, little man, shouted the stranger, who was a good foot taller than Robin. That is, unless you want a ducking in the stream. Not so fast, not so fast, tall fellow, answered Robin. Go you back until I have passed, or maybe I will do the ducking. Why then, cried the stranger, waving his staff, I'll break your head first and tip you into the water afterwards. We'll see about that, said Robin, and taking an arrow well, Feathered from the wing of a goose, he fitted it to the string. Draw that bowstring ever so little, shouted the stranger, and I'll first tan your hide with this good staff of mine, and then soak you well in the stream. You talk like a plain ass, exclaimed Robin scornfully, for were I to bend my bow, I could send an arrow quite through your proud heart before you could touch me with your staff. If I talk like a ass, answered the stranger, you talk like a coward. You stand there well armed with a good long bow, which I have only a staff and am well out of your reach. I scorn the name of coward, cried Robin, slipping the arrow back into his quiver and unstringing his bow. Therefore will I lay aside my weapons and try your manhood with a quarter staff such as your own, if you will, but wait there until I cut one in the thicket. 
Here I abide, said the stranger cheerfully, one foot on the bridge, until you are ready for your cold bath in the stream. Robin Hood stepped aside to a thicket of trees and chose himself a stout six-foot staff of ground oak, straight and true and strong. Then he returned to the bridge, lopping and trimming his weapon as he came. He flung his bow and quiver on the bank with his hood and his horn beside them, and set foot again on the bridge, crying merrily, Lo, what a lusty staff I have, and a tough one at that, the very thing for knocking an insolent rogues into the water. Let us fight here on the bridge, so that if one of us goes into the water, there will be no doubt who has won, and the victor may go on his way without a wedding. With all my heart, said the stranger, I scorn to give way. Have at your head, so saying, he grasped his staff one quarter of the way from the end, held his other hand, ready to grasp it by the middle, when using it as a shield, and advanced along the narrow bridge. Robin came to meet him, flourishing his weapon round his head, and by a quick feint got the end in under his adversary's guard and made his ribs ring with a blow. This must be repaid, cried the stranger. Be sure I'll give you as good as I get for so long as I'm able to handle a staff, and I scorn to die in your debt when a good crack will pay what I owe. Then they went at it with mighty blows, rather as if threshing corn with flails, <laughs> Presently, the sharp rattle and clatter of wood upon wood was broken by a duller crack as the stranger struck Robin on the head, causing the blood to appear, and after that, they lashed at each other all the more fiercely, Robin beating down the guard and getting in with blow after blow on shoulders and sides until the dust flew from the stranger's jerkin like smoke. But on a sudden, with a great cry of rage, the stranger whirled up his staff and smote so mightily and with such fury that even Robin could not withstand it, but tumbled head over heels into the stream and disappeared from sight. Good fellow, good fellow, where are you now? shouted the stranger, kneeling on the bridge and gazing anxiously down to the water. Here I am, shouted Robin gaily as he pulled himself out by an overhanging hawthorn, just floating down the stream and washing my bruised head as I go. I must acknowledge myself beaten. You're a fine fellow and a good hitter. And as the day is yours, let there be no more battle between us. With that, Robin picked up his horn and sounded a shrill <clears throat> blast on it. Then turning to the stranger, he said, Whither were you hastening in the greenwood? I trust that you can spare time from your business to dine with me. Indeed, I insist upon it. I must use force if persuasion will not bring you. To tell you the truth, answered the stranger, I was in search of a man they call Robin Hood. Before Robin could answer... There was a crashing in the thicket, and out bounded Will Scarlet, followed by many another of his men, making a bold show in their well-fitting doublets and hose of Lincoln Green. Good master, cried Scarlet, what has befallen you that you blew the call for us? You are bleeding and wet to the skin. Nothing has befallen me, answered Robin, save that this fine fellow here has just tumbled me into the stream with that long staff of his. By the rood, exclaimed Scarlet, he cannot go scot-free after so insulting bold Robin Hood. Come on, my merry men, let us give him a turn of the cold water. No, no, laughed Robin, he's a stout fellow and tumbled me over in fair fight, so let him be. Come now, my friends, he added, turning to the stranger, these bowmen will give you no cause for fear. They are all my friends, and they shall be your friends, too, if you'll set your hand in mine and swear loyalty to Robin Hood and his companions. Speak up, Jolly Blade, and never fear, and we'll soon have you as fine a shot with the long bow as you are a player with the stout quarterstaff. Why, here is my hand, cried the stranger, and my heart goes with it, honest Robin. My name is John Little, and you need not fear that I will bring any shame upon you and your merry men. I am skilled in the arts of war and of the chase and will follow you loyally wheresoever you may lead. I still think you need a ducking, said Scarlet. Later that day, as they all sat around a fire with which two plump does were roasting, but a good sprinkling with brown ale will at least do you no harm. It is our custom here in the Greenwood to give every man who joins us a new name. What say you, my friends? Shall we not make this into a christening feast for our new friend and bestow a Greenwood name upon him? Well said, good Scarlet, cried the outlaws, gathering round in a ring of laughing faces, and Robin shall be his godfather. Agreed, smiled Robin. Now to your work, good parson Scarlet. Why then, cried Scarlet, filling a gigantic mug with foaming ale, attend all of you. This child, the babe brought here for christening, was called 
John Little. But seeing that he is so small, so puny a babe, being indeed no more than seven foot high, and a mere L or so about the waist, what say you, child, a mere yard and no yard and a quarter? Well, well, a year of venison and strong ale will make you two yards about. As I was saying, seeing that the child is so undersized and still undernourished, interrupted John Little, sniffing hungrily in the direction of the steaming venison, seeing all this, continued Scarlet serenely, we'll turn him back to front and name him Little John now and forever. Long live Little John. With that, he made as if to pour the ale over his godchild's head, but Little John twisted the mug out of his hand and shouting aloud, Thus Little John pledges Robin Hood and all who follow him in the merry greenwood. He set the great tanker to his lips and drained it at a draught. After that, they feasted and rejoiced far into the evening, but thenceforward Little John became one of Robin's most faithful followers and truest friends, and in time, as Will Scarlet grew too old for such active service, he became his second in command. But though he grew no shorter and certainly no narrow, narrower around the waist, the name of Little John stuck to him, nor was he ever known by any other.